Okay. My name's Jim Howard. I've uh, been in Shondells a long time. As you know about it, people like me who aren't able to build their own airplanes. Shondells is a great club, so I'll put it in commercial for them. Uh, this book is called World War II Memoirs, The Memories of Robert Trapps Rutledge, World War II, Army Air Force Captain and Navigator, March 1942 to December 1945. The man who wrote this, uh, who I'll call Uncle Robert, is my wife's uncle. Uh, I was a navigator, electronic warfare officer in the Air Force, and I retired in 1994. Uh, I was trained as a transport navigator because in 1974 they did that, but I flew uh, Air Force and FL11, so. I never did the kind of navigation that Robert's going to do here for us, but uh, uh, I have a lot of respect for the people who can, particularly in these days. About the book, uh, what, anything in italics is, is, is Robert speaking. Uh, basically, what he wanted to do with this book is uh, he didn't want to make it like a quote unquote war story book. He wanted to tell he wanted to tell people what it was like to ride the bus station to take the aviation cadet exam, go all the way to North Africa and Italy, fly 50 missions as a B-24 navigator in the Mediterranean theater, and then come back alive. Uh, so the book has five combat missions in it, but mostly it's about what it was like to become a crew member and what it was like to be a crew member in the war in the, the war. Uh, and really, you read a book like this, and it really tells you about the greatest generation. I mean, that's not a joke. Those people were the greatest generation. And this book just uh, uh, convinced me of that if you didn't already know it. Here's how I became involved. Uh, I only met Uncle Robert a few times because he lives in California. But he started telling me these stories about being a B-24 Nav, and I was completely blown away by A, how difficult that flying was. They're doing it basically with uh, with nothing compared to our airplanes. Uh, from a navigator point of view, the risk was so high, and he was so modest about it. Uh, and he had, had worked for a long time on this book. Uh, this is a vanity published park pack book. There aren't very many copies of it like in the world. So I said, uh, when he passed away in 2011, uh, we had the full-blown Arlington Cemetery with the, the caissons and everything, incredibly impressive. And I, I was talking to his family, I said, we cannot let this book just go into 100 people's closets. Uh, so I eventually, it took me a while, but I got the book converted to a Kindle book. And it's on Amazon now. And, and I'm, I'm working on an audio, I'm working on an audio book. If you, I love audio books. I tell you what, it is really hard. If you're reading a book that's got all kinds of foreign place names in it, and it has to be perfect or Audible won't take it, if you're looking at two to three hours for every ten minutes of uh, processed audio. So it's, it's going to take you a while to have an audio book version of this at one point. And again, the main reason I'm doing this is because I don't want this story lost. Now that it's on Amazon, now that it's got an ISBN number, uh, this will be there. You know, forever. This was for Robert's original cover. He liked it a lot. Nobody else did. We didn't like it a long time and stuff like that. But we didn't fly 50 combat missions, so we don't get a vote. Uh, so I, I hope, Robert, I hope you don't mind. I changed the cover for, for the Kindle book to something a little more eye-catching. Didn't change the title, though. If you want to get it, it's $3. Robert Travis Rutledge is the best way to find it. Just go to the Amazon, select books, type in Robert Travis Rutledge, it'll take you right there. This is uh, Uncle Robert. You know, when he was 19, he was working in the Civilian Conservation Corps as a surveying technician. His older brother, who deserves a book of his own, uh, was already in the service. Robert was going to join the Corps of Engineers, but uh, his older brother Jim, who's my wife's dad, said, you know, go to aviation, you would be an officer, you get paid more money, you know, it's cool. So uh, uh, he took the bus to the home in Tennessee, took the entrance exam, uh, he, uh, he slept in the bus station, he makes a point there were no like benches, they had armrests and couldn't stretch out. And he made a friend in there who was a prostitute who wanted, who, I, he was from, they were from a pretty kind of straightforward religious family, so I don't know that he would have known what to do with her, but she wanted him to like be her, her sales rep. 
but he, he passed on that. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he slept. He slept in the bus station. He took the test uh, and uh, passed. And they said, "Okay, go home. You're going to tell Graham. He's going to tell you what to report." That's a big deal. November 6, 1974, uh, is when I got. I graduated from ROTC at UT, and it's the same thing. It said, "Go home. We'll let you know when we need you." Big package comes in the mail. It's like, "Whoa, my whole life's changed," and it certainly did. Uh, so let's go through his training here, kind of how, how he went. Uh, the first thing they do is essentially basic training. They call it the pre-flight training. This is what's now Maxwell Air Force Base. He talks about all every slide in here is, is, a, is a good, a big story in the book. But basically, this was pretty much military basic training, kind of Air Force style. He makes the point they did not have to crawl through the mud under barbed wire with machine guns and fire them. But they did do a lot of drill with World War I uh, rifles. And it was his inspections, military courtesy, customs, physical training, and aptitude testing. He thought everybody in the Air Force was a pilot, uh, but they're not. So during this course, they, they measured their aptitude and they put a note on the bulletin board to who's going to what school. Robert was selected to go to NAM school. Now, that's probably a pretty good selection, but being a surveyor and being really good with numbers, uh, he later became an, uh, uh, a kind of an accountant. But uh, he good, was good with numbers, you know, line, knew what a line across the earth was. So they sent him to NAM school. Uh, it's very interesting to read about this. I followed this up on Wikipedia. They, his class, 4212, the base, like they had just broken the ground on it. They just had like tar paper huts, basically, and they had a runway. And that's where he did his, his flying training. He did 900 hours of flying training. And uh, I think it was a, a, a bamboo bomber, you know, a beach AT-7, where he did most of his training, I believe. And these were the things he listed that they learned to do. They, they learned to navigate by pilotage, radio, celestial, and dead reckoning. Those were apparently the, 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 the main items. And of course, you know, weather, aerodynamics, and systems, all that stuff, just the same stuff they would teach now. The Air Force no longer has people called navigators anymore. Uh, they call them different kinds, of, they have different wacky names for them, like combat systems operator, and I don't know what all, because, you know, you can get promoted by changing the name of something. Uh, I got these from Wikipedia. This is uh, the AT-17. Uh, this is what uh, the inside of one looked like for the navigator students. I was the last class in NASA School in the Air Force in 1974 to include the T-29, which is just a Convair uh, 240 round engine, round piston engine airplane with spits out a lot of oil and a cowling. Uh, and it looked just like that inside. Just it was, it was enough for side-by-side -side students. It's a, that's a sextant uh, housing up there. And the same damn thing, you know, doing this, everything, you had to mathematically, you had, you had to mathematic, mathematically prove every darn heading you ever gave a pilot until about halfway through when they awarded you nav judgment, when you could then say, well, yes, the whiz wheel says, you know, 240, but I really think 245 would be better. It was only halfway through the course you were even allowed to do that. I'm sure it was the same in those days. Uh, after, after NAV school, he went to uh, what was then called Alamo Gordo Army Air Force Base, now called the Hallman, uh, where he did his forage and bomber crew training. And again, they had just broken ground on this base. If you, if you can see here, these are these like tar paper shacks they were living in. Uh, uh, the thing that's the big takeaway from this is how dangerous this training was. Uh, they crammed their bags more than full. They flew them 24 hours, seven days a week. He talks in there about how you were you were allowed like a rest period of 80 hours, of eight hours, but that could appear anywhere in the 24-hour day, depending on when you know your classes and your airplanes were available. So you might find yourself taking off at one in the morning, uh, and then you've been studying, you know, and your rest period was from noon to, to six or eight. In Alamogordo. Now they were real cold. You can see they're wearing a winter flying jacket, so I think it would have been worse in the summer. But this was real high intensity training that these bomb crews went through. And they started forming them as crews here. He, he basically uh, formed the core crew, especially the officer part of it. Uh, and uh, he still kept in touch with the guys who survived uh, right after they died. His pilot, we'll talk about later, uh, is still alive. 
and is still in contact with the family about this. So he continued, uh, uh, I'm not sure what airplane he flew, I should have asked him, at Alamogordo, it may not have been a B-24, but definitely he got, B his B-24 RTU replacement training unit was at Clovis. Now I spent a lot of time at Clovis, because that was an F-111 base, and uh, I was on the staff where I was out there all the time. I wasn't stationed there, but I was TDY there a whole lot. So, so he said, when he said the wind blew continually, sand counts went into every darn thing. It's, it's still true out there. If you go to Clovis, man, it is windy as all get out, and it is sandy, and God knows if you had an airplane tied down out there, you might as well not paint it because it's going to be silver uh, pretty soon. They cut a month out of the training schedule. It was supposed to be four months at this school. They only stayed three. He had uh, his next stop was in Kansas, Topeka, Kansas, and they gave him six days to get in route. This kind of funny. So he had just enough time to like ride the train for two days, hop off, visit his family for a day or two, and then ride the train to Kansas. And, and it, one of the little stories, just to give you an example, the stories are in this book. Uh, that's Uncle Robert. He he saw a, a, a nice looking girl in the in the dining car. And then he, uh, why don't you say anything? No, he just went back to his apartment. He was real thrilled. He, first of all, he felt like he was fantastically rich. I felt that way when I was a second lieutenant. Because I never had two nickels to rub together. I did learn to fly a bird's nest in a J3 in the, uh, from 69 to 74. But it was only, I was working at a grocery store for three fifty an hour. And uh, it was $6 an hour wet to fly the J3 from, if anybody ever knew Ray Harding, and he was the one operating the bird's nest, which is now Austin Executive in those days. So I could stack groceries for two hours and, and fly for an hour. And of course, now I'm a software engineer, and I can software engineer for two hours and maybe fly an hour. <laughs> I'm lucky. <laughs> I can't take it easy on the gas. But anyway, so he had bought some bourbon for his dad, and he decided he better make sure it's enough quality to present to his dad. After he off checked the bourbon, he decided to roll in the car, looked more attractive than he remembered. He went out there, a, a sailor had cut him out of the pattern and already corralled him. So, you know, you snooze, you lose. Uh, I did a little follow-up on this. Topeka Army Airfield was uh, uh, also a replacement training unit, but I don't believe Robert actually trained there. He, he just went there to get the B-24 he was going to take to war with his crew. Uh, he wanted to be sure, I, I, he, I, I'm sure he wanted me to list the crew members' names, there they are. Uh, uh, he felt close to all of these guys, uh, at least three of these guys. Uh, uh, Rogue Q, Ford, and I think Bullish, these those guys didn't come home. They, they, they died during the war. Uh, Robert was 21 on his, on his 21st birthday. The pilot, Mr. Tilcott, was 23. He was like the old man. These guys had no, I won't say they had no flying time, but they had, uh, I believe he told me he had around 200, uh, 100 hours or 200 hours, something like that. The pilots had about 320, that's what he told me, during their training flight flying. The only, you know, the only thing they got going for them is they're 21 to 23, so, or 19 to 23, so they don't know how stinking dangerous what they're about to do is. I mean, I, I'm convinced that's the only reason they can make it, because if they were old and gray, like you know, one or two of us, they'd say, wait a second, I've got 300 hours of flying, and you want me to fly to Egypt or I've never heard of Egypt, you know, forget it. You know, but these guys got in an airplane. And this is what really gobsmacked me. I asked him, I wanted to know what the training pipeline was like. Uh, one of the times I talked to him, he, he told me a lot of what's in this book. I had the modern the, the, it was not modern anymore, the ancient Cold War Air Force in my mind. And so I said, I thought, I, I want to know, how did you get over there? And you know, he says, Well, I, they gave us an airplane, we took it. And uh, I envisioned, okay, they probably got somebody like Ernest K. Gone to sit in the left seat, or they flew in a big formation, you know, with an experienced crew in the front, and then the student, you know, the brand new crew's fault. No. No. They went solo all the way to Libya. Uh, think about that in a day where there's no GPS. 
you know, um, there's no ADF, there is a DF, it's a mechanical contraption with a tube radio that might work. For those of you who remember when TV sets had tubes, we know they burn out all the time, you go to the drugstore to test them. Uh, uh, so that's not something you could count on, even if it was going to work at all. So, first leg, they went from uh, Topeka to Morrison, they were supposed to go to Topeka to Morrison Field, West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, over the Gulf Coast, they had a runway prop, and it wouldn't fetter. And the pilots told the pilot told the guys, prepare to bail out. So that's a, a fun way to start your war, isn't it? This is this is what uh, Robert says. You can read it. But basically, he and uh, Rope Q, who I believe was the the bombardier, they were in the nose compartment, and they didn't want to jump out through the nose wheel door. They wanted to jump out through Bombay. So they get their parachutes on, they crawl through the tunnel, and Bert's parachute deploys in the airplane. Uh, uh, yeah, you can laugh about it now, but I didn't think it seemed too funny then. Uh, so he was a big guy, so they were talking about, uh, about well, you know, I'll hold on to you. Or, you know, we'll bundle it up and you throw it out when you jump out. <laughs> but basically, Bert was toast if they had to bail out. He was a dead man. There was no getting out of that airplane. I mean, there was no ergonomics. I mean, I'm sure many of you have been in the EAs, B-24s, or other warbirds from that era. There's no sticking ergonomics. There's no padded metal in there. It's all bare metal and bars and big heavy iron things. Uh, there's no getting out if you don't have a, if you can't, if you've already deployed your parachute. Uh, I did with my best friend was in an F-4. And he punched out of that, and the airplane was going out of control at the time, and it punched a hole in the parachute, and he landed with no parachute and bounced off the side of the sand dune. And it messed him up pretty good, but he somehow survived, and nobody knows why. It shouldn't have. So they might have made it. And this is interesting, too. The co pilot noticed an electric toggle switch with the lever in the off position. He flipped it on, and they were able to restart the engine, which now functioned normally. So, so what does that tell us? That tells us these were new guys. This is a big, complicated airplane. It would be a challenge for any of us to fly B-24 today. I mean, we've all seen the cockpits of these warbirds. You know, there's a lot going on, and there's, you know, they weren't designed, you know, by a user experience expert who works at Apple. Uh, so uh, these are new guys. They're brand new. So mistakes like this kill a lot of people. You saw, I think I forgot to mention, you saw on the slide about the bomber training, they lost 10 crews while he was at Clovis training the bomber. They lost 10 crews because they were flying at night in the mountains, uh, and they just uh, uh, flew into the mountains on a fairly regular basis. It was very, to even get to the ferry flight was a heroic effort, in my opinion. So, they actually landed in, uh, I think, in Alabama, and they, they repacked the guy's parachute. <laughs> Somebody looked at the engine. How many times have we had that? Uh, as airplane owners, you know, you've ever had an airplane where the motor racks up in the air and the mechanic says it's perfect? Well, that's kind of what they had. Uh, so they flew from, uh, they went to West Palm Beach. They did not know where they were going. All they knew is they were going to West Palm Beach, Florida. They told them nothing that they didn't absolutely have to know. Uh, not even where they were going. They didn't know where they were going. Uh, they just were told, okay, fly to West Palm Beach. And when he got to West Palm Beach, they said, okay, fly to Trinidad. This is interesting. That's a, a we, there was a base there that Brits had, and during, because of Lynn Lease, uh, we took over that base, and they stopped off there. Uh, then the next day, they flew from Trinidad to, to uh, Dutch Guiana, which is now Suriname. There's kind of an interesting little historical factoid there. If you remember World War II, or read about it, you know that the Germans pretty early on invaded Holland and took it over. So there was a government in exile in, uh, in England. And the government, that government, which just was guys who got out of town before the Germans got there, they, they basically said to the United States, take over Suriname, you know, yours, use it, you occupy it for the duration. And so that, there was actually a fairly substantial uh, US military presence in what's now Suriname. Uh, the next day, they, they flew from uh, Guiana to uh, Belém, Brazil. He was fascinated by Devil's Island. That's the picture he took of Devil's Island. He thought that was pretty cool for a guy from Tennessee to fly over Desert Island. I have a map in here. 
the next stop after uh, after uh, Brazil was uh, Natal. Natal's right on the edge of the, the bulge out towards uh, Africa, and they were delayed there for more engine work. And they did what GIs are going to do. So, you know, they kind of played around and tried to explore the local customs. There we go. So that's the flight. That alone is pretty, pretty awe-inspiring flight for brand new pilots and, and navs and crew members. Uh, you, you read Ernest K. Gaughan, you know, and it looks like this is pretty easy, but if you have really no nav aids, you know, a lot of these rivers and stuff, this all looks the same. You know, so it's not just it's not just follow the magenta lines, even get down here to Natal to make the jump over to Africa. Uh, uh, I know this from my vast experience of, you know, 20 T-29 rides and 10, 20 T-43 rides. The T-43 was a 737-200 that we used for NAS school when I was there, uh, which was basically the exact same technique they were using here. And it's the only ride I ever pinked in the Air Force was the night cell ride before the uh, the night cell check ride. You had to do five star fixes in four hours. I can't do five star fixes in four hours. A star fix, there's no stinking calculators. No, 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 not even in 1974, let alone back then. Uh, it's a long handwritten computation of dividing, adding, multiplying, subtracting with big tables of star tables in a book called Asia 249 uh, to come up with a three star fix. And to do that accurately five times in four hours was more than I could do. And I was terrified I was going to wash out. And I was also saying, there's no way they're getting me in a transport airplane if they're going to want me to do this because I couldn't do it. Uh, fortunately, on the check ride, we only had to do four star fixes. So I scraped through the night cell check ride. So, you know, that experience and this sort of navigation stuck with me all these years and how difficult that is. Uh, so, the, the pilot challenged Robert to go fly to Ascension, which is a little tiny island right out here between South America and Brazil. Uh, it's just a big airport, really. Uh, it belonged to the Brits. He said, let's try this without using the RDF, the manual direction finder. And so, I never asked him if he did this day or night. The way I would have done it would have been to take off and get to about here while it was still night and take a three-star fix. Because a, a good navigator could take a three-star fix uh, and get a pretty accurate position and then let the sun come up so I can see this little light <laughs> so I don't fly past it. Uh, might as well use my visual aid right now. This is what the primary tool that Uncle Robert would have used. This actually belonged to my uncle, who was uh, also, he never saw combat but he did go through dance school. This is a sextant. Uh, this is an aeronautical sextant. If you, uh, if you envision a sextant as being something with a big arm, like the sailors use, that will not work in an airplane. You have to have a little bubble to create a horizon. That's in this thing here. So you would do, uh, you, this would clamp onto the side of, of uh, uh, you, it would either hang with this hole here, depending on the airplane, or some of them had a, thing, a fixture to clamp it to. And uh, you look through this, and you dial this knob, and you have to do it, you had to, uh, you had to get your star. Now, you're not seeing the whole big constellation. You have to, you have to be, your DR has to be close, because you have to get that star into this eyepiece. You have to be that close to get a good star fix, because one star looks a lot like the other. Although the experienced guys can tell them apart, so you either mount it like this or this, depending on the airplane. You look in here, and you find your star, and you track it for one minute, and it's got an averager that reads out uh, here, I think. Oh, no, excuse me, where is it on this one? Somewhere in here, there's a little numerical readout. And uh, then you do that three times. You know, you have to watch your watch out of this thing. And then you write down the average, do this star, and then you do that star. If you had the sun, it has filters on it so that you can look at the sun without burning your eyes out. Sunlight's only going to give you a line of position. What that line of position is has nothing to do with what you want. It has something to do with whatever time, what time of day it is, and uh, and you know where the sun feels like being at that moment. So 
So you would only get a line of position, you would not get a fix from a sunline. They also had a drift meter, which could give you your actual course over the ground, if you could see the water, and if you see the waves on the water. And they're flying pretty high, they're flying, you know, 25,000 feet sometimes. So that was a guess. So he navigated to Ascension with basically, you know, something like a Contiki route level of navigation compared to what we have today. But he made it to Ascension. There were, he said there wasn't very much in Ascension Island, except that as soon as they shut the engines down, a GI put his head in there and said, we'll pay $100 a bottle for any American liquor. But they didn't have any, so he, he missed out on the $100. He wound up flying, uh, this, you see the route here? He went through from uh, Ascension to Ghana, Ghana to Nigeria, and Khartoum to Sudan, and he wound up in, in Cairo, Egypt, which was where the, the headquarters of the Mediterranean Air Force was. And they just kind of shot, I got the impression, but they kind of showed up and it was like, oh, okay, here's another bunch of these guys, what are we going to do with them? They had him fly to Oxfield, and they got to see sightsee a little bit. He really liked this lady, she worked in some kind of R&R &R, uh, facility there, and he, he's, he's got a couple more pictures of her and talked about how nice she was and everything, so he liked this lady. Uh, so they did a normal GI thing when you go to a, a strange new country. Is, you know, kind of look around, try to get it. He was uh, a little shocked by the amount of uh, prostitution that, that was going on around there, because that's not something he was used to being a country boy from Tennessee. So that's his route across Africa, up here to uh, uh, Cairo. When they finally figured out where to send him, they decided to send him to Libya. And he wound up being assigned to the 98th Bomb Group, uh, 343rd Bomb Squadron. And he would be with the 98th <coughs> for the rest of the war. So there's the last leg. This is Benghazi. He was actually at an ox field, and he says in there several times, it's called Lady. You never see it on the map. It was just a desolate piece of desert, really, I think. So there's their, that's the crew, that's the B-24 uh, that they, they flew from Topeka, Kansas, number 112. He never tells us what the name of this airplane was if it had one. Uh, that's their, uh, he said that's their officer's club. Uh, uh, this is, you know, like, I don't know, the, the Starbucks delivery or something. And, you know, those are the guys just hanging out there. Uh, he talks a lot about what this was like, and I, I can't go into all the detail. I wish I could. It's quite interesting stories, though, about what it was like in the squadron there. And so it's pretty primitive. I'll talk about the clean sheets in a minute. Here's some more pictures from their forward operating base. And uh, pretty much the same pictures that you would see from people in Afghanistan coming home. Uh, you know, when they when they got time on their hands, the EPA would be shocked. You might know what that is. I know some of you guys know what the silver thing he's holding is. Ken, do you know what that is? Ken doesn't know what it is. Uh, Ken, that is bug spray. Back when bug spray was manly man bug spray, not the little pseudo bug spray you buy now. This was like ultra powerful, kill anything that moves bug spray that you got in those things. Um, and I guess those were banned probably 20 years ago. I'm sure it causes cancer or something. Yeah, you know, it causes everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it kills every it never affects every thing. Yeah. <laughs> now he did he does uh, he does talk about five combat missions in the book, but you know, can't leave that out. He flew 50. But he talks about five of them to give you an idea of what's going on. The first one he talks about is a, uh, an attack on Saloon France. Again, this is more of a, like a, an interesting navigation question. Apparently, this was not a heavily defended target. It's a dock facility in France there, near Marseille. But that's quite a long flight. Uh, it's 14 and a half hours to fly out here, drop bombs in France, and fly back. Uh, they. Uh, they had to put in two 400 gallon ox tanks in the bomb bay. Robert did not like that. Uh, the B-24 already had a little bit of a reputation as kind of a firebird. Uh, and then to add 800 gallons of gas in the bomb bay right in the belly, you know, with just the bomb bay doors to protect them, he wasn't super thrilled about that. Uh, he does mention that uh, they did get some opposition. One crew lost two inches and came back with two inches on the same side which was debatable whether that was even possible. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I'm not a four-engine pilot, but 
there's some kind of bad DMC problem when you're flying, you know, seven hours across water on two engines uh, on the same side. Which God knows what kind of battle damage on the other side. So he was pretty impressed that those guys made it back. But again, it was a pretty not too difficult a navigation problem because you can see they're flying over, you know, pretty respectful landmarks. And at that point, you know, he was not the lead nav. And these formations, the lead nav, everybody was supposed to follow. So we'll see later, it kind of doesn't always work out. But, but uh, that was the theory anyway. Uh, he did, uh, they were in North Africa shortly after we kicked the Germans out. There was a lot of, uh, of uh, I guess, broken war material there, and he took pictures of some of it. I don't know, how's it our aircraft ID? That looks like some kind of joint or I'm not sure what, I don't have any idea what that thing is. What this guy's in. Now he wanted he he said this there's a reality to start us to war with some interpretation. I included these pictorial reminders. These were given to him by some Italian civilians that they encountered. But I put them up here too because this you know it's easy to look back on this as some sort of grand adventure. But this is what happened. This was a German crematorium when they evacuated. They just set fire to all the bodies they could. Here's some dead Germans they found. Uh, my grandfather from Jasper, Texas, uh, had these pictures. He hated Germans. He actually ran away from, he, he said, uh, I remember him telling me this, and he's a good Texan who would never tell the whole story, uh, but he said, when I was uh, 16, the high school teacher humiliated me in front of the class. So you know, there's only one thing you can do, right? Kill him. Uh, so I don't know if Granddad really killed his teacher, but he did, and I found in his paperwork, he did go to Canada, get a mess boy, became a mess boy on the ship, went over to England in World War I in 1914, I believe, joined the Coldstream Guards, wound up in the Battle of Yip, which is the biggest gas attack in history, was the Battle of Yip he was in. Uh, and I even had his discharge papers. He hated Germans, and he had a dead German picture, and he loved them. I mean, it was like, you know, his favorite picture. Oh, my God, I hated those guys. Uh, I don't think Robert hated anybody. He wasn't that kind of guy. But he wanted to see that, you know, this isn't all fun and games. I didn't believe this. I did not believe this. He told me they gave us cyanide pills. And I'm thinking, what? I never heard of that. I read all the history books about World War II. I never heard of cyanide pills. No, I still have mine. That's weird. But sure enough, in his little locker with his scrapbooks and stuff, <laughs> he still kept. In uh, 2010, he had cyanide pills. Uh, and he talks about, he got a brief from the Intel officer, and they said, well, you know, if they're, you know, if they're coming into the pitchforks, or, you know, they're pulling your toenails out, blah, 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 you bite that, and your troubles will be over. And he's saying, and they're pretty new in the theater at this point, he said, you know, is this like a morale builder? Uh, <laughs> uh, why are you telling us this? We don't know nothing. They made a point of not telling him anything. All I knew is what they were supposed to do today and tomorrow. That's all they knew. Uh, now, later on, in the latter part of his history, he did start flying with radar, which was a great big secret. To me, it wouldn't have been enough of a secret to buy a sign on a capsule. Because he wouldn't have known how to build a radar set. You know, he didn't know it was a radar. But, you know, is one of these crew members going to teach him how to build a magnetron? I think not. But anyway, somebody, it's the military, somebody got promoted. We're coming up with a good idea, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but things, things had not changed as of 1994. I suspect they haven't changed now with respect to staff officers coming up with bright ideas. And I was a staff officer once, so I probably came up with my, uh, my chair of those kind of silly ideas. Uh, he, I'm sure he would want me to mention this. Hey, I think he was a little sensitive about kind of being teased by soldiers uh, about. Uh, well, you guys, you know, you're pampered princes. I've actually been heard people call us that. Uh, us as the Cold War Air Force. Uh, uh, and he pointed out that he wanted people to know that it was a coin toss whether you were coming back. Yes, you got to sleep with clean sheets. You only flew roughly once a week or every 10 days. The rest of the time, you had a nice facility. But, in B-24s, it was a coin toss if you were going to live. If you were in B-17s in the UK, it was it was uh, <laughs> it was more than a, worse than a coin toss. It was really favored in the house, 
And even the fighters, you know, they didn't have quite such a loss rate. But one out of four, you're going to do Russian roulette with a four-round chamber and one round in it? That doesn't sound like fun. So uh, even the fighter pilots, the elite of the whole world, just ask one, uh, 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 they were rolling the dice, and the dice were loaded uh, pretty seriously. So I'm sure if I'm Robert here, he wanted me to point this out. So yeah, they got clean sheets. Well, you saw there, you know, they're, they weren't living in the ribs, although he had kind of did later. But uh, uh, they uh, they earned they earned uh, those uh, clean sheets. Uh, he talks a lot, a little bit, in fact, a fair amount about how the, the 98 bomb group and the squadron work. Uh, the leadership of the squadron was a commander. You see, of course, was I think they've changed all of this since I got out. But I think the commander being CC, the DO is director of operations. They had a squadron man, which Robert eventually became, and he actually became a group man later, and a squadron bombardier. And these are the guys who did the, you know, the planning and kind of the leadership of the thing. Just like Ken is the president of the Sean Gale Chance, so he would be the IRCC. Uh, he does a darn good job of it, too. Uh, he talks about the commanders, he admires commanders a lot. Uh, the number of air forces, which was the higher level, uh, the level of command uh, above uh, the bomb group, did not want squadron commanders flying missions any more than a bare minimum just to keep some kind of credibility with the troops. Because at that point, you're getting to, dealing with people who are really not expendable. They know more, a lot more than Uncle Robert would have known, uh, at least early on his tour. And uh, they're valuable. And they had this huge Air Force. Remember, you know, the Air Force and the whole military went from like this big to this size of Memorial Stadium almost overnight. So the core leadership, and the ranks were so low now compared to today's Air Force. I mean, you had squadron commanders as captains and majors. Uh, you had uh, uh, group commanders as uh, lieutenant colonels, or even uh, maybe colonels. You had only a handful of generals, very few generals in those days. Now the Air Force has got practically hundreds and hundreds of generals. they got a general for every darn thing in the world. Uh, so, so the ranks just escalated way up uh, from those days. He talked, he really admired one of his bomber commander, Colonel William Carnes, uh, and talks about him a lot. Uh, Colonel Carnes was killed in a landing accident. He was flying a right sea on a training mission, but the landing went bad for some reason, and the, the colonel was killed. Uh, the pilot who survived was all emotionally torn up about it, as any of us would be if our co pilot had been killed, uh, particularly a guy who apparently they had a lot of esteem for. Him. They made that co-pilot go back and fly an airplane that day. Uh, because they said, you've got to get back on the horse. If you stew about this, uh, uh, it, it'll just be worse for you. And, it, and he talked several times in the book about how you had to kind of accept that some of your friends weren't coming back. Uh, you couldn't dwell on it. You had to look forward. Because otherwise, you would just go nuts. Uh, his squadron did move to Italy in November of 1944. Yeah, about that time, he became the 98 bomb group leader navigator. This is not in the book, but I asked him about reluctant crew members. I said, were there people who just couldn't take this pressure, who, who just couldn't perform or wouldn't perform? He said, yes, there were a few. There were a few crew members who just could not do it. And I said, well, now the Brits were terribly hard on those people. They basically put those guys in prison. They said, the Brits called it lack of moral fiber. And that was like the worst thing you could be. 98 bomb group felt like not everybody can do this. Okay, you guys who will keep you on the logistics missions, they had a logistics airplane. They had a green B-24, all the rest were tan. And that would run around and get supplies and carry mail and stuff like that. So let's got to fly that airplane, maybe. Uh, or, or they'd fly very easy missions. They would keep them out of the hardcore combat missions. And nobody threw any rocks at those guys, according to Uncle Robert. Uh, so I think that's the right way to handle that. Uh, uh, there's a bunch of anecdotes about him traveling around. He was flying, I think he stopped in Algiers, and he ran into Air Force One. Uh, students of history will remember the terrain, uh, the uh, conference that, I can't, who was the capital of Iran? Tehran. Tehran, the Tehran conference with uh, Roosevelt, uh, Stalin, and uh, Churchill. That's President Roosevelt's airplane on its way to that conference. It's a C-54. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, there's more in this. This is uh, my wife's dad, Jim Rutledge. They stopped in Algiers, and 
Uncle Robert found out that a B-29 unit were staging through there to go to the Far East. And he said, well, my brother's the B-29. They wouldn't let him take a picture, but he found the B-29 guys and found out that uh, his brother had just gone. He missed him for like a day. His, his, his brother had been one day. Jim Rutledge deserves his own book. He went out to the Far East as a B-29 bombardier. He flew eight missions on the mission number eight. His airplane got all shot up, and they diverted into Vladivostok, where he was interned uh, for about a year in Siberia. And then the KGB helped him escape to Iran and back into friendly hands. He had a letter, he's, we still have it in a scrapbook somewhere, where he stayed in the Air Force and made a career out of it. And the letter said, you will not ask Jim Rutledge anything about what he did in the war. It's all classified. STF, you know, you don't ask him about this. He's not going to tell you. It's none of your business. Uh, because at that time, it was pretty sensitive. Russia was not at war with Japan. So, but they knew they wanted to come into the war as soon as they were sure Germany was beaten. Because uh, they wanted to grab a big, you know, big piece of real estate like a lot of people did in those days. So, so the KGB got him out, he came back, and he wouldn't talk about that until right before he died. Finally, I guess, yeah, and my, my wife got him to tell us a little bit about it. And there's a book called Escape from Siberia that documents that. When he was on the squadron, or group staff, I'm not sure which, I think the group staff, uh, he got his, his uh, boss got an admin flight to England. <laughs> so his squadron, every day, you know, he, he said, uh, hey, Robert, what, what navigator should I take on my and then flight to England. I'm sure it was. <laughs> so he jumped on that and went to England. <laughs> and they, they dinged the wingtip on a telephone pole when they landed. And uh, Uncle Robert said, you did that, right? You did that. Because now darn it, we're going to have to stay here for a week until they fix our wingtip. So he got a big kick out of that. And he talks more about that in the book. There's a lot of animals like that in the book. Uh, here's another combat mission. Uh, this is the scariest one. To me, well, well, they're all scary. They're all scary. This is pretty scary, though. Uh, he's attacking a tight uh, port facility. They lost the number three engine approaching Italy, so they turned around. They didn't go into the into the actual battle. Uh, so they wanted to divert to Malta, which is an island out in the Mediterranean between Libya and uh, and Italy. Uh, they had an undercast, so they weren't quite sure where they were. And they, the clouds broke over Sicily, which was still occupied by Germans who proceeded to shoot at them. So they at least knew where they were now. Uh, they took the answer to the hydraulic system. They already had a dead engine. Two of the other engines were damaged and not producing full, full power. They only had one good engine. They started to lose an altitude and they're headed for Malta. And as they approached Malta, the second and third engines failed and they've got one engine. Uh, and they've got unknown battle damage. They wind up doing a water landing. Uh, Robert, again, this goes back to the ergonomics. You know, they didn't have, you know, a poopy suit. They didn't have a custom, I had a custom fitted helmet, you know, when I was in the Air Force. They didn't have any of that. Uh, he got behind the co-pilot seat, which was had an armor around it. So, uh, and he leaned back up against that and just held on. All he remembered was a great wall of water. And the next thing he remembered, he's underwater, out of the airplane. He does not know how he got out of the airplane. He was obviously ejected in some manner or other. So he wakes up, he's underwater, he pulls the CO2 cards, one failed, and the other, and this is on his life vest with the CO2 bottles in them, like you can buy at West Marine today. And so he pulls both of them, one of them works and gets them up. Um, they were rescued by the British Air Sea uh, Rescue Service that was there. You know, the RAF was very proud of that. They had a, a really excellent, in World War II, an excellent, uh, uh, water rescue service with seaplanes and these uh, uh, like PT boats, real high powered things with Allison engines, with, you know, P 51 engines in them, and roar out there and pull people out of the water. And that's what they did. They lost one of their crew members in that accident. Uh, well, before I talk about that one, uh, I believe this is the mission where the pilot got a silver star and he got either his first or second distinguished flying cross for this. I could be wrong about that in the slide. They did a mission. Uh, uh, a mission to Werner Neustadt, Austria. Uh, they were bombing from 30, uh, they had good VFC, they're bombing from 23,000 feet, which is kind of low. 
put you more in the flat envelope. They, Robert would prefer to go higher, but lower was more accurate, and that's what the boss said, and that's what they did. Uh, he talks about the. Okay, that means I've got to wrap this up. So, but uh, he talks about how they had to go straight level from their initial point to the target. They couldn't maneuver, they couldn't do anything. All they could do is fight off the, uh, uh, any fighters that they encountered with, uh, with their guns. Um, this is the one where he, uh, oh, he got, he got wounded, he didn't know it. He got a shell fragment in his thigh, but he didn't know it until they were in the back. And then when he got home, they pulled it out and gave him a purple heart. He said, oh, I don't get it. It's just nothing. He said, oh, was, you know, you bled, purple heart. <laughs> so, okay. That was the first of two he got. Now, this is very interesting to me. Uh, the instruction of Monte Cassino, those of you who may not have studied the invasion of Italy, by the way, uh, Italy was occupied by uh, the 88th Division, Army's 88th Division, on June 5th, 1944, which is why you never heard of that. That's when Rome was occupied. Uh, there was a monastery up on a mountain, and the uh, I was going to talk about von Clausewitz and the Kami style. I don't have time for it. But basically, we had the German the German, uh, the German general was uh, a much better general than what we had on our side, and uh, we were kind of doing things the hard way. But these these are big army uh, allied army forces are trying to get from the west coast of Italy over to Rome. There's a big mountain with a monastery on top of it. We believe, and we're being pinned down at the base of this mountain, uh, this mountain ridge, we believe that this abbey is being used by German artillery bombers. It turns out it wasn't, but we thought that. So uh, this was a big deal, maximum effort deal. We're going to wipe this monastery off the face of the earth. It had been a protected target for historical reasons, but uh, uh, they were going to, they decided to do this. The big decision went all the way up to the Prime Minister and the President to decide to do this. He dropped the first bomb. He was real proud of that. And the interesting thing for me personally, there's the monastery, uh, it's there where it is, Italy, and they're trying to go, they landed down here, and they're trying to go over here to Rome. And there it is, before and after pictures. And he put this in his book, The Sketch, because he showed they didn't bomb the town and casino, which is down here. He did actually they did, but he didn't. He had, like, Anybody you ask, he scored what we call a shack right on the monastery. You know, whoever bombed the town wasn't him. Uh, he wanted to be sure you knew that. There's a family connection. This fellow here is my dad. He was in the uh, uh, Texas A&M class of 1944, which means he started in September of 1940, which means that in December of 1941 he was just halfway through his sophomore year in college uh, at UT at A&M in the Corps. So he got sucked right up into the Army. And he was a little upset. He had been in the 36th Division, where my son is now a member of, by the way, the 36th National Guard Division, go Arrowheads. Uh, he, uh, uh, he got removed from, he'd been in it since he was 16, and deployed with it, but then they took him out and put him in the AA Division, which was a drafting division. Didn't have really any history. They had have people from all over, as opposed to the Guard units. Guard units were super tight. Any former National Guard or current ones here? You know what I'm talking about. Guard units are super tight compared to any active duty unit. Uh, I mean, their their spine is so tight because uh, they never rotate. They're always together for their, as long as they're in the guard. Uh, so anyway, he uh, this letter was written. Uh, my dad was down there, pinned down by the Germans, and uh, he wrote this letter. Uh, I think a couple of days before this mission we're talking about. And uh, I can't tell you where I am. The censors he's, he's quoting a poem he saw. I can't tell you where the censors will ban it, but if I'm safe, I'll be sure to write if I'm still on this planet. And he had, I had more letters from him. It was horrible being a straight like rock in Italy in World War II. They were in a winter campaign, mud, horrible weather, and the Germans were fighting like devils. Both Uncle Robert and my dad had tremendous respect for the German military. Uh, my grandfather didn't really have much for He took it a little more personally than those guys did. Uh, they went to Vienna. Aircraft factory, there was no fighter escort for a lot of these missions in those days. We did not have P-51s over there for most of the time he was there, and the, uh, the other uh, fighters couldn't quite go with the B-24s. Uh, they hit heavy IMC, the formation got scattered. When they got back into BMC, there was only one other bomber in sight. Uh, 
The interesting thing to me about this was how disciplined these guys were. When I was in the Air Force, we as NAVs would bitch at the pilots and tell them what to do. Just because we did. Uh, they didn't do that, and it's probably better if they did, particularly in combat. Somebody's got to be in charge on a mission like this. Uncle Robert didn't think it was a great idea to go to ship into this heavily dependent target, but uh, they did, uh, and he had a uh, he had a uh, uh, attacks from any one of nines, uh, minor death, damage. He got a so uh, pilot got a silver star. He got his second DFC from that mission. Uh, this one, real quick, another deep mission. Defense is equal to Pulaski. His squadron bombed Pulaski. He was on the group staff at that time, nearing the end of his tour. He did not fly the Pulaski raid, but he did, uh, was a big part of planning it. Uh, they had ME 110s with rockets that could stay out of the 50 caliber range, and they had uh, uh, Focke-Wolfs. Uh, he ran a lot of those. Regenberg, another big battle. They deployed Chap, the former electronic warfare officer. That was really interesting to me. Uh, he said, luck was your best ally in this. And that goes through all through the book. It's just a coin toss, whether you're coming home or not. Uh, he had a B-24 with a plexiglass nose. Uh, Fock, and, and he's, he'll never forget the, uh, the Fock Wolf 190 that blew right into him, blew into him head on, uh, just pulled off at the last second. And they just, he and, it was just like a very personal battle between who was ever in that fighter and Robert, you know, and, they, I guess Robert at least, it was at least a draw because he got to come home. There was a blue on blue mission where, some, where a bomb dropped through a B-24. That's another toss the coin that those guys lost. He came home, New York City saw the, uh, saw the Statue of Liberty. He flown 326.7 combat hours and 50 missions. They sent him to, uh, they sent him to a hotel in Florida where he stayed a couple of months. And the flight surgeons, I guess, were concerned about what we now call PTSD. And so they want to talk to him and make sure they're okay. And wonder what his problems are. Well, he's in, in Florida with an Ocean View hotel. He's got all his back pay. He was a poor kid. He never had money before. He's in a hotel room with his buddies. They survived the darn war. And, you know, his problem was how to prolong this. <laughs> <laughs> and here's some of the pictures of how he suffered during his decompression stay <laughs> in Florida. That's how these are all, that's Uncle Robert there, those two different ladies. Uh, he, uh, he, he had some peace time. He stayed, I think, three or four years at, after he came home. He was an instructor in NAV for a while. He talks about the RAN, that was the, the GPS of his time. And he was a squadron commander, and he got out in 1945, went back to school, wound up being a vice president of an industrial machine uh, uh, company in, in uh, Southern California. And uh, that's one of his favorite pictures in 1998. And that's uh, my presentation. Thank you very much.